Tonight at 10, the story of the MI5 spy who terrorised and abused women, but the government protects his identity. What are you doing? There are video images of the man attacking his partner with a machete. She says he's still a danger to women everywhere. Both MI5 and the government are against his identity being revealed. His former partner says he abused his status to terrorise her and others. He said he worked for the security services. He had men in high places who always had his back, who would intervene and who would actively kill me if I spoke out. Campaigners say it's a bad reflection on the state's response to violence against women. Also tonight, no more party fines for the Prime Minister. The police closed their inquiry. In total, 83 people have been penalised. Millions of tonnes of grain stuck in Ukraine as the UN warns of a global food crisis if exports don't resume. This crop is due to be harvested in just over a month's time, but the farmers here still have no idea where they're going to store it or how they're going to get it out of the country. And the film score that mesmerised millions. Its composer Vangelis has died at the age of 79. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel, McElroy sets the pace. A storming start to the PGA Championship in Oklahoma sees him on five under after his first round. Good evening. We start tonight with the story of an MI5 agent accused of violent abuse and threats to kill his partner and whose identity has been protected by the security services and the government. The spy, who is not British, is said to have terrorised his partner while also threatening to sexually abuse and kill young girls. The BBC has won a legal battle to reveal the story, but we are not allowed to name the man. Video images show him threatening to kill his former partner with a machete, amid evidence that he is a right-wing extremist with a violent past. Campaigners say the case is a terrible reflection on the state's response to violence against women. And the BBC says that publishing the story is firmly in the public interest to protect other potential victims. This exclusive report is by our correspondent, Daniel De Simone. Wielding a machete, this is an agent of the British state. Ultimately, this position within the security services was used to terrorise me. A violent MI5 agent who was able to exploit his position despite a long history of abuse. He said he would be able to kill me and my daughter too. But the abuser can't be identified. This is the story the government tried to stop. Beth, not her real name, lived with him in the UK, but the relationship became ever more abusive. There was so much psychological terror from him to me that ultimately culminated in me having a breakdown. He told her he was informing on networks of right-wing extremists. He said he worked for the security services. But the role was abused. He had men in high places who always had his back, who would intervene and who would actively kill me if I spoke out. Is that what he said? That's what I believed and that's what he said. The security service runs agents in terrorist networks, informants who secretly work with MI5 officers, their handlers. Beth says this agent's extremist mindset wasn't an act. He also described his paedophile fantasies and named young girls he wanted to sexually abuse. His mistreatment of Beth included this attack. I thought I'd better film this, mostly because I felt afraid. He threatens to kill her and returns with a machete. And at the point that I say I'm going to call the police, he's punched me in the face and I've fallen. And you can hear me screaming and he tries to stab me repeatedly. Weeks later, he referenced the incident, unaware he was being filmed, telling her she might get killed. Asked if he'll do it, he says... It was almost me. He then describes his desire to kill. It's constantly in me. This murderous thing is always in me. I always imagine how I bludgeon someone to death. Following the attack, police went to their home. The agent was arrested and charged with assaulting her. But the investigation was limited and the case was dropped. 
Beth said he came back and continued to mistreat her. Within weeks, the agent vanished and she was hospitalised due to a mental breakdown. But extremist material found in the house, including a note he wrote about killing Jewish people, had already generated a police counter-terror investigation. Some of Beth's possessions were also seized by detectives from their home, but returned to a relative months later in an alarming visit by an unidentified stranger. I've established the mystery man didn't work for the police. He was, in fact, an MI5 officer. The counter-terror investigation ended with MI5 being passed the evidence on their man. It was a highly unusual move by MI5, suggesting interference in a criminal inquiry. Counter-terror police say no criminality was identified during their inquiries, but have apologised for the fact Beth's possessions were not passed directly to her. But how far back does his mistreatment of women go, and where is he now? We've traced him to another country. After leaving the UK, while still under counter-terror investigation, he began working for a foreign intelligence agency. Before Beth, he met Ruth, not her real name, abroad. Violence. Always violence. Their relationship was horrifying. He started to tell me things that no human being would be able to get over, such as swimming in a river of blood, eating children's flesh. I had to listen to this every day. He said he would be able to kill me and my daughter too. Fearing for her life, she was taken to a refuge. I was psychologically broken, really broken. The women's shelter ordered an ambulance to bring me to the hospital. We found he spent years in Britain using her surname to hide his real identity while working for MI5. I think it's not fair and I'm angry. I'm very hurt. I feel cheated. You can't have trust. There is no justice. The agent threatened to kill and sexually abuse young girls known to both Ruth and Beth. Both women remain traumatised. The government said it will not comment on security or intelligence, but the court order is aimed at protecting national security and avoiding a real and immediate risk to life, safety and privacy. The government took us to the High Court, first trying to stop this story ever being broadcast and then seeking to dramatically limit what we could report. They failed, but we've been legally prevented from naming the agent because of a risk to him, despite the threat he poses. Violence against women and the state's response to it is one of the issues of our time. Yet the British government has thrown its full weight behind stopping women everywhere being warned about this dangerous abuser. And uh, Daniel is with me now. Daniel, you've worked on this for a long time. I think it's fair to say there have been lots of obstacles along the way, as you've alluded to there. You're still not able to name this man. Why is that? We're not, and that's because the government took us to the High Court. They got an order preventing us from naming him. They said that uh, were he named, there would be an unacceptable risk to him from extremists and there would be a damage to national security. But, of course, things like this are normally secret. They don't... MI5 doesn't normally have people like me investigating them, exposing this kind of thing. And a case like this can generate a wider debate about the more secret part of the state's response to violence against women and girls. Last year, with the murder of Sarah Everard, uh, we saw outrage about a police officer abusing his power. And there's been a lot of focus since then on the role of the police. Maybe now, because of a case like this, we might see more focus on MI5 and some of the intelligence agencies. Daniel, many thanks once again. Uh, Daniel Simone, our correspondent with that story. Now, the Metropolitan Police has uh, closed its investigation into parties held in Downing Street during lockdown, which means that Boris Johnson will not be receiving any more fines. Mr Johnson and the Chancellor Rishi Sunak were both fined last month for breaking Covid laws at a birthday party in June of 2020. The police investigation has resulted in a total of 126 fixed penalty notices being issued to 83 men and women, most of whom are understood to be civil servants. 
Uh, they were at events on eight different dates between May of 2020, at the very height of lockdown, and April of 2021. Our political editor, Chris Mason, has more details. It was not long before Christmas that Partygate was first exposed. And since January, officers here have been investigating it, investigating the Prime Minister and the government he runs, whether they abided by the very laws they made. And now, their inquiries are finished. I think it was very important to carry out the investigation. It was extremely important to do that in a really painstaking and thorough way. We've carried out an impartial investigation. Uh, I think the, the results show that there was an issue there to be investigated. We now know a team of 12 detectives worked full-time on this inquiry, looking at 12 gatherings, 345 documents and more than 500 photographs. It cost nearly half a million pounds. And ministers sound relieved it's done. The police have decided uh, that it's all over. Um, they've handed out those fines that they want to hand out. Your Prime Minister has apologised for the birthday cake incident. I'm sure he and, frankly, the rest of the country now want to move on to those really big issues, the war in Ukraine, the cost of living crisis. Of those who were fined for parties in these buildings and those close by, 28 people got more than one fixed penalty notice. At least one person got five. The Prime Minister, his wife and the Chancellor were fined once for a gathering here in the Cabinet Room on Boris Johnson's birthday in June 2020. A do down there in the number 10 garden in which people were invited to bring your own booze led to some people being fined, but not the Prime Minister. There was a Downing Street Christmas party on Friday night. Do you recognise those reports? <laughs> I went home. <laughs> and you'll remember this, a mocked up news conference in which there was talk of a Christmas party, which Boris Johnson wasn't at. We know some who were got fined. His fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> and it was not socially distanced. <laughs> The Labour leader Keir Starmer was in Leeds today talking transport. He himself could still get a ticket, a fixed penalty notice, over a beer and curry event just over a year ago. But his focus today was on what went on in government. Well, what the investigation has shown is industrial scale law breaking in Downing Street of 120 or so fines. And that reflects a culture and the Prime Minister sets the culture. The advent of Partygate was on the 1st of December last year. Five and a half months later, today is a big moment because for much of that time, people have wondered what would happen if the Prime Minister got another fine or so many that he could wallpaper a wall with them. We now know that is not going to happen. But it's not quite over yet. There is still a parliamentary inquiry to come and the full report by a senior civil servant. So a significant chapter in Partygate has closed today, but it's not finished. Chris Mason, BBC News. Well, as Chris is saying, plenty of questions still unanswered. Let's go live to Scotland Yard. Our home affairs correspondent there, Daniel Sanford. Lots of people seem to be puzzled, Daniel. Why is the Prime Minister fined for that birthday party and not for some other events? Well, Hugh, detectives in, in this investigation were dealing with an ever-shifting matrix of constantly changing coronavirus rules, and they haven't really wanted to discuss how they've been interpreting them. But I think there are now some clues in who's been fined and for which events. If you take the birthday cake party before Cabinet, for example, everyone seems to have been fined for that. It was a non-work-related event. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's wife and the Chancellor of Exchequer all got fines. But these social gatherings at the end end of the working day, the police have, I think, accepted that there was a work element uh, to those. So, for example, a leaving do which the Prime Minister popped in, he hasn't been fined for. But other people that might have come in especially for that event or stayed on for a long party afterwards, well, they have been fined. And that seems to have been the, distinct, the distinction. In any event, 83 people have been given fines, the vast majority of whom are politicians, political advisers and civil servants. The very same people who were telling us how to behave, telling us how to interpret the rules that they had made during the long months of the pandemic. Daniel, many thanks again. Uh, Daniel Sanford there at New Scotland Yard. The US Senate has approved nearly $40 billion in aid to Ukraine. It's the largest aid package since the Russian invasion. 
Earlier, the American Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, had accused Russia of using food as a weapon of war. There are 20 million tonnes of grain piled up in Ukraine because of the invasion, and the US is calling on Russia to allow ships to leave the Black Sea ports, including the major port of Odessa, with food and fertiliser supplies. Our correspondent Caroline Davis is there. She sent this report. Ukraine's wheat helps to feed the world, but while its Black Sea ports remain closed, much of it is beyond the world's reach. Over 3,000 tonnes of grain fill Yuri's warehouse, but because of the issues transporting it out of the country, no one wants to buy it. I don't know who in the world to ask for help. We would like to be helped to sell this grain at any price, as long as the people don't go hungry. I think that all Western countries should help us. You need to bang your fist on the table, open the Ukrainian ports, stop the Russian invasion and take out this grain. How do you feel knowing that there are many people around the world that would be desperate for this crop? There's a feeling of despair. I'm talking now with tears in my eyes. It's hard to say. Yuri's problems are faced by farmers across the country. This crop is due to be harvested in just over a month's time, but the farmers here still have no idea where they're going to store it or how they're going to get it out of the country. Some goods can be taken out by road, others by rail, but not in the same quantities that used to be transported by sea. Since Russia began its invasion, ships can't move for fear of being hit, and the sea has also been mined, which could take months to remove. Andrei Stavnitsa is an owner of one of the largest ports in Ukraine. We have about 80 ships uh, that are uh, basically ghost ships in Ukraine right now. Uh, the crews have left them. Some of them are full, some of them are empty. They're in the ports or outside of the ports. They're standing there idle. And for the crews to come back, their shipping uh, companies have to uh, get the clearance from uh, insurance companies. And these insurance companies are not obviously not happy to allow this to happen because the sea is full of mines. How long do you think it will be until you can reopen the port again? We have no idea when we will be able to reopen the port. We are facing a disaster that's going to happen in the next few weeks when the new crop is here and the old crop is not exported. The UN has warned that unless Russia allows the ports to reopen, there could be mass hunger and famine for years. Russia says sanctions imposed on it would need to be looked at if the world wants to solve the crisis. While many in the West will feel that Russia is holding safe passage through the sea hostage, if no agreement is reached, Ukraine's crop could rot while others starve. Caroline Davis, BBC News, Odessa. The International Committee of the Red Cross has said that it has registered hundreds of Ukrainian prisoners of war who've left the besieged Azovstal steelworks in the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. Uh, the Russian authorities say that all those who've left will be treated in line with international standards. There are fears that some could face prosecution by President Putin's courts. From Moscow, our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, reports. Tired and wounded, Moscow released these images of Ukrainian fighters leaving the steelworks they'd been defending in Mariupol, giving themselves up to the Russians. Ukraine is hoping for a prisoner swap, but in Russia, there are calls to put some of the soldiers on trial for war crimes. They are killers, they are criminals, but we give them medical care. But your country invaded Ukraine with more than 100,000 troops. That's aggression, isn't it? No, it's not an aggression. It's not an aggression. Don't bully us. Moscow tries to justify invading Ukraine with a false claim. That it's gone in to fight Nazis. A war crimes trial could shore up an unconvincing narrative. The Kremlin wants Russians to believe that in Ukraine, their army is battling Nazis and NATO. Europe and America were all plotting away to attack and destroy the motherland. And there are many here who believe this parallel reality, but not everyone does. Dmitry Skurichin admits that his country, Russia, is the aggressor. He is appalled by the bloodshed and wants his whole town to know it. He's transformed the outside of his shop into a message board 
with the names of Ukrainian towns Russia's attacked. Kherson, Irpin, Kiev. Peace to Ukraine, it says. He's even turned his roof into the Ukrainian flag. I thought this would be a good way of getting information out, because for the first few weeks of the war, our people didn't know what was happening. They didn't know that Russia was shelling cities. Some don't want to know. Traitor has been graffitied on Dmitry's door. And the police have been round. He's been fined for discrediting the army. The front of a shop isn't for expressing opinions, she says. He can say what he thinks, says Anton. I think attacking a neighbouring country is a strange thing to do. And in Russia, protesting can be a dangerous thing to do. But Dmitry is refusing to stay silent. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Moscow. Back home now and at the High Court, Colleen Rooney's lawyer has accused Rebecca Vardy of being a highly unreliable witness. It's the last day of the case where Mrs Vardy is suing Mrs Rooney for libel for alleging in an online post that she had leaked private stories to the Sun newspaper. That's something which uh, Mrs Vardy denies. The judge will reserve her ruling on the case to a later date. Our correspondent Colin Patterson has been following the hearing. Rebecca Vardy arriving at court for the final time on her own as her husband Jamie Vardy's team Leicester City had a game tonight. For the first time the Roonies were not present, having booked a holiday thinking the trial would be over and were spotted at Manchester Airport. Today it was the closing arguments. The barrister of the defendant, Colleen Rooney, went first, saying that Rebecca Vardy regularly and frequently leaked stories to the Sun, and if she approved or condoned the leaking of information through her agent, Caroline Watt, seen here on the left, then she was responsible for Caroline Watt's actions. He spoke about the deliberate deletion and destruction of evidence, accusing Rebecca Vardy of deleting WhatsApp messages and then having lied about it under oath. At this point, Rebecca Vardy picked up her laptop and left court, returning an hour later, missing hearing herself being called an entirely unreliable witness. Then it was the turn of Rebecca Vardy's legal team, who argued that it was a very simple case if you cleared away the conspiracy theories. They said that Rebecca Vardy did not leak the information, nor did she authorise anyone else to leak. They asked that a substantial award of damages should be made. This trial has covered a lot of ground and brought up many subjects which have never been mentioned in the High Court before. Gemma Collins, face planting on Dancing on Ice. A mobile phone which ended up at the bottom of the North Sea in Davy Jones's locker. And unexpectedly, the pop star Peter Andre has become a major talking point. The use of social media is at the centre of this case. Rebecca Vardy says she suffered public abuse and ridicule on a massive scale because of an unfair accusation. Colleen Rooney says her privacy was repeatedly violated and she had no choice but to investigate and go public with her findings. It's estimated that each side will have a legal bill of more than one and a half million pounds and whoever wins will still be hundreds of thousands of pounds out of pocket. Many have asked why this came to court. At times, Rebecca Vardy, who brought the case, looked like she was asking the same question. The judge will now consider the evidence and return with a detailed written judgment in a few weeks. Colin Patterson, BBC News, The High Court. Some more of the day's news. A man who was obsessed with serial killers has been jailed for a minimum of 31 years for the murder of 18-year-old Bobby Ann McLeod. She was abducted from a bus stop in Plymouth last November. Cody Ackland was 24 pleaded guilty to murder at an earlier hearing. He was previously unknown to the police. Those most at risk from COVID should be given a booster dose this autumn across the UK. That's the advice from the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. Over 65s, uh, care home residents, frontline health and social care workers and the clinically vulnerable adults would be eligible for the jabs. The committee said that this would top up levels of protection for the winter. Natasha Eberhardt died in 2018, one of at least 10 Bristol University students to take their own lives over a two-year period. 
Natasha's parents have now taken a civil case against the university, arguing that uh, she was owed a legal duty of care. And tomorrow a judge will give his decision, as our correspondent John Kay explains. Well, here we are, Natasha's room, very much untouched. It's been four years since Maggie and Bob's daughter took her own life. Uh, that was the first Christmas present I got her. And we haven't really stopped to grieve or, or, or get our, our act together at all. Hello. Um, you're pretty cool. So, you Natasha Abrahart was in her second people. year at Bristol That's University. Just, um, this is normal life for me, you know, how it is. She was 20 years old. And although she'd always been quiet, that's the first one. It was only after her suicide that Natasha's parents found old emails and messages. I'm sitting on my own on my computer. Revealing the extent Natasha. of her social anxiety. As long as you continue to learn and love to learn, that's all that matters. In the weeks before she died, Natasha's anxiety had got worse. She hated speaking in class, and had struggled with the interviews that were part of her physics degree. On the 30th of April 2018, Natasha was due to be assessed in an oral presentation here, in a lecture theatre containing more than 300 seats. She never turned up. That day, she took her own life. I remember thinking, why my daughter? You, you get these thoughts, why her? What have we done to deserve this? The Abrahats have now brought the case to court, arguing in a civil action that Bristol University owed Natasha a legal duty of care and should have made more allowances or adjustments to help her. Natasha was a student with a disability. She had significant social anxiety disorder. That disability was so significant that in certain circumstances she was simply unable to speak to the assessor. We say the obvious reasonable adjustment for the university to make was just to assess her in writing. In a statement, the university said it did offer Natasha alternative ways of being assessed and staff did help her access professional help. The court heard she was one of at least 10 Bristol students to take their own lives in two years. The university says it recognises mental health as one of the biggest global health issues. Tomorrow, the judge will announce his decision in a case that could have implications for students, parents and universities across the country. John Kay, BBC News, Bristol. Now, if you have been affected by any of the issues in John Kay's report, Details of organisations offering information and support are available at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. Or you can call free of charge to hear recorded information on 08000 155 947. Vangelis, the Greek composer best known for composing the score for the film Chariots of Fire, has died at the age of 79. Vangelis won an Oscar for the soundtrack back in 1981. He also wrote music for many other successful films, including Blade Runner. Among those paying tribute to Vangelis was the Greek Prime Minister, who praised his ability as a pioneer of electronic sound, as our correspondent David Siloto reports now. Chariots of Fire, 1981, a soundtrack that was both an Oscar winner and a number one single. The work of Evangelos Odysseus Papathanasiou, better known as Bangalas. He'd started playing piano when he was four, and in the 60s, age 25, teamed up with a young Demis Roussos to form Aphrodite's Child. He then went on to have his own chart hits, but the place where he really made his mark was film. His musical signature was the sound of soaring hope and lonely infinite distance sport and space. Movies such as Blade Runner. It was a vision of a distant future. Los Angeles 2019. And it needed the sound of the future. My interest in it was not to create a symphony orchestra, which I, I can, it's very easy. 
but to go for further than that and do things that the symphony orchestra can't do. He was an explorer, I think he was a musical explorer. In a way. He explored musical idioms. He bust through the old concept of, of a movie score. He was the creator. I think Vangelis created a new landscape, a musical landscape that many, many other composers today have taken advantage of and, and, and even gone further in some, in some cases. At the Olympics London 2012, a familiar tune. Even 30 years on and with a comic twist, it could still stir the soul. He was private, publicity shy, but his life of constant travel and lonely hours in the studio, you could hear something of the life of Vangelis in his music. The Greek musician Vangelis has died at the age of 79. That's it now, BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.